Just want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. It's called Optimizing Your Workforce Across Global Delivery Centers. And it's part of our Neo Insight series, which is basically our commitment to um, the globalization space to put out points of view, helpful resources, articles, white papers, webinars on topics that we feel are important in our space. And so welcome. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so if you're joining us for the first time today, just wanted to kind of give a little bit of context and background on Neo Group. We've been around since 1999. Our singular focus is on global services and um, global sourcing, and we are advisors. So we help clients throughout the sourcing lifecycle um, figure out how to do uh, how to best leverage global talent, global suppliers, and global locations. And um, you can take a look at our website. We do this through three uh, solutions primarily, which is advisory services, governance solution, and our risk monitoring tool called Supply Wisdom, which we put in a bucket called Supply Monitoring and Analytics. And so um, moving on for today's session, um, um, it's going to be basically how to think about um, approaching your next wave of, of new outsourcing initiatives, how to decide, how to decide uh, where to send that work, um, how to, you know, what, what do you think about when you, when you hop aboard that next train stop on the journey of globalization. And to walk us through this topic and this challenge today, we have Hamanth Pootley and Pankaj Deer. And uh, our first presenter, Hamanth, has over 30 years of experience in the space, leads many of our client engagements here at NEO. And uh, Pankaj, similar um, experience, impressive background with both buyers and suppliers. Um, and the wonderful thing is that they just recently went through this exercise um, of helping a client decide how to go, uh, how to expand their um, global services. It's fresh in their minds and they're ready to hop in and tell us about that process and um, share some insights with us. So, Heyman's Pankaj, thank you both for your time today. I will put myself on mute and let you guys take on over. Uh, Loras, thank you for the intro uh, um, comments about the company and about me and uh, Pankaj. Um, um, so today we will take you through the the context of uh, we set the context by talking a little bit about. Uh, uh, what it is that uh, this topic really involves, uh, in, in what what is the background of a typical client organization for whom this might be meaningful. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about how typically decisions are made, strategic sourcing decisions, uh, and, and the role of uh, the importance of, of having a, a quantitative uh, data-driven approach. And in, with that as uh, introductory comments, we will uh, introduce the attractiveness and fit analysis, uh, talk a little bit about how it works, how it is used, uh, which is actually best brought out in the case study, um, uh, which we will take you through. And lastly, we will talk about benefits uh, and take questions after that. But in between, we have a couple of uh, quick polls that we will run you through uh, so that you can give us your thoughts and your, share your experiences uh, that pertain to some specific questions that we have for you. So with that, Florence, we, we move to slide five, which is the context. So uh, for this particular methodology and uh, for, for where it is used typically, uh, what I'd like you to think about is a client organization, which may be yours, for example. Uh, or, or somebody uh, that uh, some other other organization that you're aware of, where typically they've already embarked on the sourcing journey and they already have at least one, if not more, delivery centers uh, on a uh, offshore or remote basis. Oh, I see that we're still here on the, a different slide. Dunas, could you help with this? Is it uh, me or is Maybe it on page, we are on page five? We are, we are okay. We are on the slide. Uh, where you were talking. All right. Good. 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 I think my network is a bit slow today. Voice is coming through, but uh, the 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 visual is a bit of a problem. Yeah. So I was saying, uh, typically we are talking about a client organization, 
that has got one or more uh, global delivery centers located across the world, uh, various uh, destinations across the world. Could be in Europe, could be in uh, in Asia, could be in Latin America, uh, and they could be either owned by the by the client organization, which is what we call captives or global in-house centers (GICs), or they could be owned by a third-party vendors offshore, and, and it, in, which typically is referred to as an offshore dedicated center or an ODC. But acronyms aside, we'll just stick with what we call a global delivery center, a GDC, which could be either of these. And we will talk about global de delivery centers uh, as a generic uh, going forward. Typically, these will be uh, situated in uh, low-cost low destinations to take advantage of uh, the cost differential. Um, going forward, uh, in our client organization that we are talking about, the, we, we are envisaging a, a situation where the client um, is faced with um, a lot of challenges by way of new work that has arrived at the, the doorstep of the outsourcing program or outsourcing initiative or offshoring initiative, if you like, um, wherein the client organization needs to uh, evaluate what uh, opportunities exist to, to meet this demand. Typically, this is essentially the demand management function if it's been set up that way, or else it could just be whoever it is that is handling sourcing. So somebody knocks on their door and says, you know what, um, either there's been some uh, change in, in, the, uh, in the company structure or there's an, been an acquisition or there's a lot of growth planned in a particular function or a particular business line and we think that there's a, a lot more that we want to bring to the, the globalization um, program. Uh, and the client then has an option to look at their existing supplier base, their own captives or third parties, and uh, see whether that's uh, those will suffice or whether they need to talk to um, a new vendor or uh, one of the incumbent vendors for uh, expanding capacity or uh, think of a, a completely different uh, in-house center that they may want to build. So that is essentially the kind of need we are talking about. So to summarize, we're talking of a client situation where a lot of growth is anticipated and we need an answer to whether to handle that, to, to, to route that growth into any of the existing uh, supply centers or to look for a completely new um, a relationship with a third-party vendor or a completely new uh, captive center to be built. Uh, Pankaj, I would uh, invite you to take us through the next slide, which is about uh, how typically uh, certain factors drive the sourcing strategy and why a data-driven approach is useful. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we are, we are on slide seven. Uh, for some of you who have a print and may not be connected to the webinar. Uh, so, so, so this slide uh, just calls out that, you know, there are, there are, there are reasons uh, why client organizations really, you know, want to embark on the offshoring outsourcing journey. And those are the whys. And, 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 you know, as a, as a reaction to fulfill, you know, to achieve low cost or to improve quality and improve process, you know, there's a set of actions that uh, can be taken. In our experience, uh, this is fine. Uh, the boxes and the bullet points really uh, demonstrate a part of really what the right approach is. Uh, but really, when you overlay, when you overlay a structure and a method and a uh, and, and a slightly scientific methodology, which is what attractiveness and fit is about, we've noticed that generally speaking client mandates and their programs of work will wrap up in the allocated time and within the allocated budgets uh, that are there. So so, so clearly using, using an approach which is uh, all of what you see but also uh, a, a part scientific, part uh, structured methodology helps to keep the program on track ensures that there are no disappointments and, and, and surprises towards, you know, uh, as the program is progressing in terms of incorrect scoping or the fact that the low-cost destination really uh, would be unable to, uh, you know, incorporate uh, the roles that, that are being looked upon for outsourcing. 
So organizations uh, enjoy success uh, when, when they use a structure and a method. We can, we can move to the next uh, slide, please. Thanks, Pankaj. Um, so with that, we'll uh, talk a little bit about the new methodology, uh, the attractiveness and fit analysis in particular in our methodology suite and where it fits in and what it does uh, and that sort of stuff. So going, taking from Pankaj's point about uh, the need for a structured, objective, and data-driven approach, uh, the attractiveness and fit analysis provides essentially that. So let's talk about the two, those two words, attractiveness and fit. Attractiveness is really, um, as name might suggest, uh, it tells you how attractive the proposition is to move a certain role or function, take it out, uproot it, as it were, from where it is right now in presumably a high-cost place uh, and move it to most likely a lo lower-cost destination. Um, for various reasons that Pankaj again has taken through. The drivers could be numerous or any combination thereof. But attractiveness really tells you two th uh, is a measure of two things. One is the, the benefits of doing that, uh, could be in dollar terms or otherwise. And the other is the ease or difficulty of doing that. So, uh, and th these, this is what we need to weigh um, and, and set off against each other. Uh, is it easy to do? If it's easy to do and, and gets a lot, lot of benefit, then clearly the answer is that it's very attractive. If it get, gets benefits but it's difficult to do, then it's kind of moderately attractive and so on and so forth. Fit, on the other hand, is about, for a particular GDC, a global delivery center, again, which could be a captive or a third party, how well does that particular piece of work fit in there? Can it be executed from there? If so, can it be done optimally? I mean, is it a hard fit? Is it a ready fit? Uh, or does it not fit at all? So as the English language words suggest, attractiveness is about uh, whether you you want to do something, whether it's move a process, function, or a role. And fit is about can it fit in any of our existing uh, destinations that we already have in our portfolio. If you remember, that's what I said in the context. This is typically for, typically for a company that already has uh, got a few centers and has got a lot of work coming their way and is trying to decide where to send it. So these are the two um, keywords that uh, our analysis is based on. And with that, I'll go to the other uh, next slide and talk a little bit more about what determines attractiveness and what determines fit. So the criteria for attractiveness that we've identified through our experience and having worked with numerous clients <laughs> is essentially, excuse me, <clears throat> affinity of two kinds. One is affinity to the end customer, and, and second is affinity to the partner ecosystem that the business is in. Um, other factors that drive uh, attractiveness or lack thereof would include uh, the uniqueness of the expertise that goes into or, or the, or the particular kind of skill uh, and the level of skill that goes into delivering a particular service or uh, executing a particular function or fulfilling a particular role, and of course the costs uh, involved. So uh, the more expensive those skills are, the more uh, rare they are, the, you know, the more uh, attention goes on to evaluating uh, how best can we optimize these. The criteria that determine fit uh, would first of all to start with it would be about is do we, in this particular destination that we are we are evaluating do do we uh, is there a rich talent pool in terms of both scope and in terms of size or scale which means that are those skills available uh, do we do we get numerous people having you know, richness of those skills in terms of breadth and depth range of skills as well as the depth of experience in those skills and do we get a large number of them to pick and choose from? And if we have attrition, we can you know, easily replace those, those uh, resources. That would be a very important criterion that will determine fit. Uh, depending on the, uh, on the geography of where the destination is, you may or may not get uh, specific skills that you're looking for. Uh, the second factor would be costs. Uh, and uh, again, if you see, look at costs, it, it figures in the attractiveness and the fit. So wage arbitrage continues to be a driver for many of the uh, outsourcing and offshoring initiatives. Um, much as we emphasize other 
factors such as quality, etc. It is not without the consideration of the, the financial model. Um, process maturity, again, is very important um, for a lot of clients. So if a particular uh, GDC offers process maturity, then it uh, looks more fit to take on more work. Um, and of course, there are a lot of location risks associated with it, which we also need to consider. Um, both attractiveness and fit are best visualized by means of uh, the decision quadrants um, on slide 10. As you can see here, we are mapping fit on the x-axis, attractiveness on the y-axis, and essentially just uh, uh, it's calibrated in just in, in, in a binary high-low kind of way. So you have high attractiveness, low attractiveness, high fit, low fit. So you get four quadrants. So the top right-hand quadrant is the highly attractive roles um, and highly fit roles for a particular GDC. This is in the context of a particular GDC. So if you have, for example, um, a captive in Bangalore and a third party um, in Ukraine, a uh, third party facility in Ukraine and uh, some kind of a BOT or joint venture uh, in um, a, a, you know, Manila, for example. So you have to do this for the, the fitness analysis for each of them. The attractiveness is for, for the source from where the role uh, is originally being um, delivered or executed. The fit will be for each of the centers that you want to bring into your analysis. So you get one of these quadrants for every combination of uh, attractiveness and uh, uh, GDC uh, uh, fit for the given GDC. So the top right-hand quadrant would, would essentially suggest that these are roles that are very attractive to move out from where they are today and, and very fit to move into the GDC under consideration. The one at the uh, opposite of the uh, diagonally opposite end of that is the do option, which is that uh, these are roles or functions that are not very attractive to move out, and for this particular GDC, they're not very attractive to move in either. So neither do they look good from the pitching point of view from the U.S. typically from the U.S. Uh, location, nor do they look very good from the catching point of view, which is the uh, the low-cost destination point of view. The other two quadrants are the gray areas, which is why they're in a, a different color. And they're in gray areas for different reasons. Well, it's not gray, it's yellow. But uh, for, for different reasons, though. So the highly attractive but not very fit for that location means that you need to look at another location for those roles. So if uh, the Ukraine is not a good, a good place, then um, maybe Bangalore is, and may, or maybe Manila is. Um, but that role potentially can move out from where it is. The evaluate later would essentially be the quadrant where you'll find roles that are not very attractive to move out to begin with, but you know, surprisingly there are uh, there is a market that can provide for those roles in the particular GDC location that we are talking about. There is talent availability, there is process maturity, uh, it offers attractive uh, wage arbitrage opportunity, all of that. So that's what you'll find in that particular quadrant. So these four quadrants is essentially where you'll find uh, our analysis uh, situating each of the roles that are under scope for evaluation. So with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Laurence for a quick poll It's coming up because we want to get a sense of what our audience today, um, what their experience has, what your experience has been by way of uh, taking some of these decisions and, and what kind of tools do you use or methods do you use and, and how do you go about doing it. Over to you, Lorenz. Thanks, Hamant. The question is, um, what method do you follow to discover new opportunities and positions that can be sent to your GDCs? All right, so what we have now up on the screen is the results. So uh, Hamant, you wanna walk through these? Sure, and I'm uh, pleasantly surprised to find that 50% uh, of our participants use an internal data-driven approach, um, and that's really nice to know. I, I wonder to what extent it uh, is similar or different from the one that we are proposing here, uh, but we will probably find out more about that in our subsequent polls, uh, which is a good segue, actually, into the next poll. 
Okay, so this next follow-up question is, what are your decisions criteria, decision criteria for process selection to offshore functions to your GDCs? Well, thanks again, Lawrence. And it's, again, interesting to note the uh, extent of participation that people envisage with the on-site uh, management uh, and drawing them into the discussions on what is attractive or fit to move. Um, Pankaj, do you have any comments on the results of both the polls? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Hemant. Uh, I, th I think the corporate directive, uh, it will be safe to uh, say that really the corporate directive is basis research and, and you know information available. So my research is zero. I think in the corporate directive, the way it pans out is hidden management, uh, you know, is, is armed with market research. Uh, but interestingly, 50 uh, stating that on-site management, which is really, uh, which which is really the the you know in in the in our example, it will be in the U.S. and and you know it, their view of really would be attractive uh, and and right to to consider for outsourcing offshoring. And of it is is uh, taken by that. So that's that's really uh, good insight for me. Okay. Thank you. And these were interesting result, poll results uh, indeed. And I think they, they fit in very well with uh, what we are going to talk about in the uh, case study, which is essentially how we conducted this for a gaming company. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the gaming industry, but for those who are not, uh, it's quite unique and different from uh, typical of industries that one is exposed to, such as manufacturing, CPG, banking and financial services, telecom, uh, and so on and so forth. Because the gaming industry actually combines uh, technology, uh, as in IT information technology, uh, but not in the, uh, again, typical applications development, maintenance and support, um, ADMS kind of way. These are more like products, as you know. I mean, many of you must have downloaded and, and uh, games or these are essentially apps. So they're more like products rather than uh, ADMS kind of work. So developing a game and uh, taking it to market is a different uh, value proposition. And uh, to understand this better, we constructed a, a, an industry value chain, which, as you can see, Starts with uh, is kicked off with the uh, research and analysis, and uh, the strategic thinkers think of what might be an attractive game to put together, and they prototype it and they design it. Uh, and when, once they are uh, narrowing in on or uh, zeroing in on a particular kind of game, they they give it for development, testing, and release. That part resembles pretty much a software life cycle. And then it's promoted and supported uh, by different teams. And then it goes back into further analysis based on feedback from the players um, and uh, watching how the game does in the marketplace. Some of them really take off, some of them don't. And uh, based on various metrics and various analyses, it goes back into the loop once again. And uh, this industry resembles the entertainment and media industry in as much as they have uh, categorized these, these particular functions as pre-production, production, and post-production, much like how you would make a, a movie or um, something like that. So that is how uh, we studied the uh, gaming industry value chain, so that we have a better understanding of what kind of roles uh, we could expect and those are visible on slide 15. We categorized the roles. There were business roles. There were artist kind of roles. There were technician kind of roles. And there were services kind of roles, very broadly put. So these are the broad categories that we, we, uh, we developed to classify the roles. And each of the roles we analyzed by way of attractiveness and fit. The roles with, which didn't have a very high affinity to being in the U.S. and being uh, rooted in, in the U.S., uh, we consider as, as attractive to move out. 
to a low cost destination and the ones that could fit quite readily in the Bangalore center were the ones that we um, found uh, you know to be good good roles to uh, locate in that facility and the way we did that was to take each of the criteria we mentioned earlier like affinity uh, customer player affinity uh, ecosystem affinity etc and rate the rate those on a scale of one to five for attractiveness as well as fit. Pankaj, do you have any comments here? Yes, yes, I do, and and I think uh, I'd, I'd like to stay on page fifteen, uh, Lawrence, if I may, uh, because now we are going to go into reasonable detail, and and you know uh, I'd like to bring to the audience, uh, you know, just an example of a role each each of the business strategy and creating development uh, uh, you know sections so typically a, a business head a studio head uh, you know would sit in the business and strategy uh, uh, area uh, you know the first segmentation uh, but that's an easy one I'd like to share with you that somebody who's a marketing coordinator also you know uh, we 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 can't in the business and strategy because uh, a marketing coordinator works a lot with the community and the local, uh, you know, uh, the Facebooks and, and and such social media companies. So, the business strategy, uh, a couple of examples of roles, uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, and, and marketing coordinator, audience development executive in this case, uh, in, in this example, create and develop uh, really, uh, you know, uh, in this company that we work with, were the were, were the, were the uh, user experience, user interface designers. It was uh, the media, the media graphic managers. It was, uh, it was they, were, they were web designers. Uh, engineering and technology is, 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 is easy. Uh, th these were QA managers, these were test managers who would really be running with once you know the design and prototype has been handed to them and they would debug the, uh, debug the product. Operations and support uh, as an example, uh, you know, uh, we, we had uh, we had we had the uh, engineers who would ensure that uh, the application remains without surprises. There is no downtime. At the same time, we had examples of staff which were doing, uh, you know, uh, player services, customer service uh, kind of roles. So, uh, so, so, example yeah, each at this stage, uh, I think, would help for you to uh, understand. Uh, not not run of the mill healthcare or uh, you know, banking client, uh, and any you know, of these examples would help the context in the subsequent slide that we go, where we sort of uh, describe. Uh, Lorenz, you could go to the next slide, please. Where where we really uh, you know take a harder look again uh, at at you know why is something uh, I'm on page 16 now. Why is something is so important to be measured in the four uh, in the four quadrants uh, in, in the four labels that you see here. Uh, and why is player affinity important? Player affinity becomes very important because most of the buyers of this uh, of this game, the app, which really uh, you know they download on the handphone, uh, the buyers are really living in anglophonic population. So for them to really understand, uh, you know, what's an American Indian and and what's what's St. Patrick's Day and what's the significance of Halloween, is a very very intrinsic. Of, of, of really what uh, the staff needs to know about what the players uh, would correlate to. So typically somebody sitting in Manila would have a far lesser affinity to some of these uh, you know uh, specific preferences of, of, of the player. Somebody in, may have very very uh, you know strong player affinity to the local who buy uh, or, or who download some of these games but for them to understand really uh, the player preferences, uh, you know, in the geographies that the players are located, that's where uh, player affinity would high, uh, you know, with, with the staff which is based in, in Canada or in the U.S. versus uh, in Bangalore or in Shanghai for the, for the purpose. Partner affinity as a label, as a categorization, uh, uh, there, there, are, there are constant promotional activities and constant, uh, you know, events and uh, high visibility activities that the company did with uh, partners where uh, these games are actively propagated 
So, so somebody who understands and who has an ability and a relationship with, uh, with the local uh, media companies uh, and is able to meet them once every couple of months or, or things for a networking session. Uh, and that role would fly. Uh, and then somebody who is remote and, and, and you know, would just not connection in terms of the community connection or, or you know, the, the networking ability with, the, with partners who are buyers of these, uh, uh, of, you know, uh, the company's products. Uh, process intensiveness uh, is, is not hard, it's, uh, but just to, just to describe uh, quickly, it is the ease of, you know, picking up the process, is it reasonably documented or is it something which is uh, on a degree of 1 to 5, it's at 1, the documentation is very poor, so something which is documented uh, with, with the reasonable strength and robustness becomes an easy candidate and score high in the attractiveness process intensiveness or the knowledge transfer capability of that activity. And last but not the least in terms of expertise, you would get certain uh, qualification uh, on shore own and, and you would get, uh, you know, limited qualifications. In the event of, you know, let's say QA engineers in, in, in this uh, gaming company, uh, there, are, there are a lot of QA engineers which are available in Ukraine and in, and in Bangalore. Uh, in the event of uh, uh, let's say web designers, you know, uh, some of these that I mentioned, uh, you know, Eastern Europe, and Asia, there, there is an abundance of web designers. So, so expertise, wherever there is uh, skills available in abundance, would score very high on the role to be deemed as highly attractive to uh, relocate, whereas certain uh, expertise uh, and, 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 you know, some games require a, a strong language affinity. Uh, and, and you know you need people speaking a certain language, and and those roles would score poorly if they were to be relocated to Ukraine because the language requirement is Mandarin. So these these four labels become very important, and they they sort of are the backbone of the scoring criteria attractiveness. Uh, so uh, I, I thought this slide uh, could could require a bit of description, and and at this stage, happy to take questions uh, because uh, the whole model and the decision to go forward or to, or, or to hold off or, or, or reconsider rests very heavily on this parameter and, and, and scoring criteria. Thanks, Pankaj. Uh, and I think um, questions can be routed to Lawrence. They'll probably pop up at the end and we can answer them in a batch mode. Uh, so, yes, so what uh, Pankaj, what you've shared with us is uh, a lot of insight into uh, how exactly the gaming industry roles uh, uh, can be categorized for the purpose of this exercise and how to do the scoring. So this is the scoring guideline that we're sharing with you. Of course, we're not giving away our secret sauce. This is just an overview of what is then taken to a further level of detail. There are weights associated with different criteria based on, on, on the client's uh, assessment of what's important to them, what's critical to them, what is core, what is a core competency and what isn't. Uh, and that sort of stuff, and we assign those weights. Um, the scoring is done typically by, by going by having workshops and extensive discussions with two categories of people. One is the immediate manager of the role, uh, and the other is the HR function that is responsible for recruiting people in those roles, uh, and because they would have a job description and they would break down the the competencies required. So by Getting these inputs from HR and the uh, relevant managers of of these particular roles in, in this particular gaming company, we found about in excess of 150 different roles. Just to give you an idea of the complexity of this exercise, you're unlikely to find that many roles uh, in you know a, a traditional uh, manufacturing company, for example. Uh, there would be some differences, of course, but they could broadly be categorized into probably not not more than high single digit or low double digit number of roles uh, in all but this is we are talking of 100, 100 and 150 plus so each of those roles we sat down with the managers with the with the hr people we analyzed them we we looked at what those those roles um, really expected from the people who, who, who delivered uh, services in those roles and we scored them on a scale of 1 to 5 based on this uh, scoring guideline and we assign weights to them and we arrive at a certain number for each role which was the attractiveness of that role 
And on the next slide, we will show you, without giving away too much information about our client, we will show you uh, how the attractiveness, uh, we did something very similar for the fit. Uh, I don't have a slide on that, but it, uh, essentially the fit criteria would be, like I said earlier, the ease of talent acquisition, retention, and development in terms of scope and scale. Uh, range of uh, uh, capabilities required, uh, depth of capability required, number of number of resources required, uh, that sort of stuff. The um, uh, attrition and, and some uh, associated with, in this particular case, a particular center in Bangalore. And those again were scored on a scale of one to five. Uh, so what you're seeing on slide 17 is the the map of for each each of those blue dots is actually a role. Some of them are actually coincidentals, which is why you probably have less than 150 dots here, but there were 150 roles, uh, or more, actually, a little more of that. Um, so we scored them on a scale of 1 to 5. We plotted them on this, uh, on, on this graph, and what you're seeing here is you, in the top right-hand quadrant is where we said we would find most of the low-hanging fruit that uh, could easily move from the U.S. to Bangalore in the first wave. And that's those are the roles that scored above three or more on the attractiveness scale and three or more on the fit scale uh, on a scale of one to five. The other four quadrants, uh, other three quadrants I've already talked about, the ones at the bottom left were really the do-nothing roles, which means just leave them alone. The top left-hand side, which is high attractive, low fit, uh, we, we didn't find too many FTEs in, in those roles, which is why, again, we said we don't really need to look at the possibility of fitting this in another GDC, so we didn't do that. Uh, and at the bottom right, the low attractiveness, high fit, we recommended to the management to take another look at why they thought that certain roles could not move out, though the Bangalore Center, the Bangalore Marketplace, uh, other gaming companies were actually performing those roles in Bangalore quite comfortably. So that's uh, how this particular um, engagement went, and these were the results. We're just showing you a slice of some of the um, deliverables, uh, cleansed, of course, to remove the client-specific information. Uh, but it should give you a good feel of the, both the, the the needs of this particular client and how we use the attractiveness and fit method to arrive at recommendations on uh, what to move uh, to their facility and which of those they should look for if they were if that need in the future became uh, voluminous then they could probably need to look at um, other alternatives such as uh, another vendor or another captive. With that, we'll uh, move to the benefits of uh, taking this kind of an approach. And Pankaj, you may want to uh, comment a little bit on uh, the, the role distribution as well as uh, take us to the benefits uh, of this particular methodology. Yeah, yeah sure. Thanks, Simon. Uh, and and you know, I I'll, I'll just talk a minute on uh, the. The fancy chart and the role distribution, which is the prior slide. Uh, just take a minute so that so that the audience actually can correlate. Uh, so so the heavy the heavy concentration of uh, of you know the upper right quadrant were were really uh, activities which involved games animation, platform development, uh, QA, and such engineering uh, type of uh, activities. Uh, you know uh, interestingly. Interestingly, the uh, you know we got support that some of these uh, some of these functions could move you know armas they could move from the junior most engineer in the function up to the head of that function and, and as an example you know uh, uh, the VP of testing uh, you know uh, the client was happy to actually take the suggestion that the vice president of testing which is a very important function. In the media and gaming space, uh, absolutely could uh, you know uh, could could be uh, could could be prepared for relocation. So uh, so you know those, those are sort of the roles which which form the top right quadrant. Uh, 
uh, you know, just on do nothing, which is really the lower most uh, left, uh, low attractiveness, low, low, uh, low fate. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, an example of uh, I already shared marketing coordinator, audience development executive, they sort of form that uh, quadrant. So uh, now uh, we can move to page uh, 18. And uh, we, we, we realized that, uh, you know, as, as we were progressing on the engagement, we were able to now nail down, uh, nail down a thought which, uh, you know, the management had. They, they, had, they had a view and a thought of what they could, uh, they could pick and, 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 you know, relocate. But I think the detail exercise helped them validate and, and you know, uh, challenge some of the assumptions that they had made. So, so the whole role selection uh, we were able to refine for them and leave uh, what roles should be impacted. Uh, the benefits case, uh, uh, you know, we were able to uh, really nail down and give them a benefits case which could hold good for the next three to five years. Uh, because this company actually is known for, uh, you know, uh, acquisitions in the past few years, this methodology they, they could reuse should they you know make an acquisition in Brazil or, or, or another part of the world at some stage. Uh, we were able to leave with them uh, a really systematic uh, project planning blueprint uh, as to you know what kind of uh, what kind of roles should go first in tranche one and what should go in tranche two and so on over the next uh, nine to twelve months. So overall overall uh, I think the client uh, got more than what uh, what they would have uh, envisage what they would get at the beginning of the engagement because it cut across it cut across blueprinting benefits uh, case validation at the same time a methodology which they could reuse uh, you know in the future should they have more acquisitions thanks Pakaj. so to summarize the uh, key takeaways from our, our session today before we move to the q and a uh, just a couple of words of a very quick uh, summary. So we've talked about uh, the attractiveness and fit method, which essentially relies on these two uh, key criteria, uh, key um, characteristics of, of attractiveness and fit. Attractiveness represents the push and fit represents the pull. So if you have roles and functions that can easily be pushed away from where they are and easily be pulled into where they need to be, then those are the ones that we identify using this method, it's, it's driven by a detailed quantitative analysis, a, a scoring which, though it relies on human expertise as it should, uh, is also, as Pankaj says, to borrow a word from Pankaj's lexicon, scientific in its approach, and as much as it breaks down things to an engineering discipline, gut feel, or an art form, and arrives at scores that are very meaningful and accurately represent ease of uh, and benefits of moving something away and the ability to catch it uh, at a particular destination. And the parameters we, we talked about, we showed you some examples, uh, but broadly the parameters can be summed up as the economics of, uh, of the business, the availability of talent uh, on, on a global scale, uh, and uh, the uh, ability to acquire and retain that talent in specific uh, global delivery centers which really drive, determines the ability to move work there. So if this is the uh, this is what we have to share with you today. And Laurence, I'd be Pankaj and I would be happy to take any questions that might have come up till now. I will give the participants a minute or two to jot them down and pass them on to you. Have you got any questions with you, Laurence? Yet? Uh, yeah, there, there's one about, um, you know, in the slide that we we're sharing the scores, uh, there's a question that asks for clarification around weightages. You had mentioned, you know, some things get weighted more than others. And uh, looking for clarification around what factors would have the heaviest weightage in uh, some of those criteria. Okay, good question. <laughs> and again, that's going dangerously close to our secret sauce as to how we define the weights and you know what goes into actually assigning weights to that. But uh, very broadly speaking, for the gaming industry, uh, it turned out that the player affinity was the strongest weight in this uh, because it really a game has a lot to do. A game developer really needs to be simpatico with the player. The game developer quite often is a player. 
so uh, himself or herself. Uh, and you know, it, it needs to be uh, native to the culture, so to speak, uh, rather than somebody who's kind of appropriated uh, those cultural uh, characteristics. So we found that the player affinity um, criterion was the one that was uh, most heavily weighted. Partner affinity was next. You're pretty much actually seeing that this in the order of, yeah, but I think expertise was third. Uh, process inten uh, intensiveness, uh, you know, in this industry, uh, when we went around asking people if their processes were documented, we just got anything between uh, a, a guffaw and a chuckle. So <laughs> this is not that kind. Of, this is not that world. This is not uh, a world. The world where you know uh, programs are documented and uh, archived because it, it, this is a the methodology used is agile. Uh, things change very rapidly. Uh, there is in code documentation, and there are, there are some notes here and there. But uh, essentially, uh, you know, this is not a significant criterion, as it turns out. But our generic framework involves all these criteria and parameters, which is why we, we keep it there. But we assign weights based on specific industries and specific client uh, uh, business objectives and goals. And we align these weights to, so as to reflect their goals and objectives. So I hope that answers that question. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how some of these um, uh, processes and, and logic applies across industries. You want to talk a little bit about how this might parallel with financial industry or um, technology or any other um, client industries? Sure. Uh, and this is, um, as Pankaj mentioned in uh, when he was summarizing the, the benefits, this is pretty much industry agnostic, uh, this methodology in its philosophy, in as much as there is something called attractiveness and there is something called fit uh, for every function, role, and every location uh, that you're trying to move things to uh, and move away from and, and move it to. So in that sense, it is, uh, that is absolutely true across all industries. The criteria, again, are, are valid across industries, except that you won't, won't have something called player affinity uh, unless you, you think that people participating in stock markets are players, for example. That's a different kind of game, of course. I'm joking. But uh, in other industries, you would have something very similar. You would have customer affinity. Uh, you know, how much does a role need to understand the customer's uh, you know, mindset and be familiar with the, with the customer's uh, way of thinking or, or you know, whatever they're sensitive to in their culture? Uh, and the importance of, of a a particular person playing that role to have uh, native familiarity with the culture uh, would be common across uh, across industry. Now, this may not be true for a lot of the back office functions, but those, as as you know, uh, we, we showed you four broad categories for the gaming industry: business, art, artist, uh, technician, and services. Many of the back office functions will fall in the services category, and that's where the, the process intensiveness, for example, would be a more dominant criterion. Uh, to what extent are those processes industrialized, documented, how complex or not they are, uh, and, and that sort of stuff. So as, a, as an approach, uh, as a broad framework, uh, this is very portable across all industries. Uh, what distinguishes one from the other is how you adapt it, uh, what kind of weights you assign, to different criteria, uh, and whether you need to define more parameters to characterize that criterion, and uh, how you uh, develop the scoring guidelines for it. So in our study, the, the initial part really is about that, is about understanding the industry value chain. Uh, some of these, the, the more typical ones, are pretty standard, so not much time is spent trying to understand the, that value chain. But uh, some of these, like the gaming industry, are, are different and unique. And uh, it's not often that we get to work on uh, a client in the gaming industry, for example. There aren't that many of those, uh, and aren't that many of those uh, doing, doing sourcing. Uh, so that becomes a unique um, exercise. But for the most part, we, our standard approach is to understand the value chain, break it down into functions and roles, uh, adapt uh, the, the attractiveness fit methodology to what is termed as attractive, what can be termed as attractive in this context, and what can be termed as fit in the locations that they, this particular client is dealing with, 
and so on and so forth. So short answer, yes, uh, it is applicable across industries, but uh, it needs to be customized, adapted, uh, appropriate weights assigned, and appropriate nuances taken care of. That's great. That was uh, very helpful. Um, one question that I've had in the back of my mind, and this is a pause since no further questions are being asked in the question box, but so, you know, in the beginning you were mentioning uh, attractiveness, you're looking internally, fit, you're looking externally. So in a case where you're considering a handful of GDCs, what would be some of the criteria, like what would determine one over the other uh, as you deter, you know, as you score some of the roles and, and functions? Um, are you including risk criteria or um, what would differentiate one GDC standing out above the others? Okay, that's that's a good question too. Um, we actually took an example of a single GDC and a single fit analysis. The attractiveness fit analysis needs to be conducted for every combination of source and destination. So if you have, for example, our gaming uh, client had studios in Boston and San Francisco uh, and other locations in the U.S., but primarily these two, um, and it had a, a captive in, in Bangalore, and they were considering a, cap, a, a captive in, in Ukraine. There was a, a company they were talking to for for certain things that I'm not at liberty to, to, to reveal at this time, but uh, there was a possibility of a captive there as well. Um, so. For each combination, actually, you need to do this analysis. For each combination and the roles involved in the source, which would be in the studio in San Francisco or Boston, you would have attractiveness. And the attractiveness is really not, when you're doing that, uh, the attractiveness scoring, you don't keep in mind the, the, destin the potential destination of that role. You just look at the role by itself and how attractive it is to move it out to any place, uh, move it uprooted per se. Uh, if you like. And then you go to the destination and look at the roles that you're, are being considered within scope. And if for each of them, you see, if you were to fit this role, how easy or difficult the fit is. And you do that for another destination, for, for an, uh, the same set of roles for another destination, and so on and so forth. So the effort involved would essentially be a function of uh, how many locations you are conducting this uh, analysis for. Uh, both the source and the destination, and how many roles are involved. So it can be quite uh, a large number. But short answer, yes. Uh, I wouldn't say that the fit part is extrinsic to the client because it's a captive. So it's still within the, the under the same roof, if you like, of the uh, of the corporation, but just a, a different subsidiary or different uh, different uh, legal entity or uh, you know because it's a different geography and a different economic jurisdiction. Does that answer your question, Ross? Um, almost. So you do the fit analysis across your GDCs, your, your captives or whatever um, um, whatever your portfolio, portfolio looks like. Do you end up at the end of the day with a fit attractiveness like overall score that you could use to then say, okay, captive one, captive two, captive three, obviously captive three has a higher score. So let's dig in deeper here. Or are there scenarios where you might, it might rise to the surface that these types of roles can go to captive one and these other types of roles will want to split and do elsewhere. Um, does this analysis incorporate those questions uh, in order to build that um, portfolio um, optimize that portfolio in that fashion? That, that is an excellent question, Ronas. Uh, we, we had, in, in, not in this particular uh, case study, but in, in prior examples, we've had situations where two destinations could potentially compete because they were both fit for a given set of roles which are attractive to move out from the U.S. So there was a competitive scenario there. Uh, so what was our recommendation? Our recommendation was to do a further analysis, uh, and Ronas, you're familiar with this, but not everybody may, may be who doesn't know Neo's basket of offerings too well. But we have another service, which is the health check. So uh, that is very, that does a deep dive on the destination itself and 
it goes beyond fit. It goes. It, it looks at a whole range of of uh, characteristics and features uh, and uh, strengths and weaknesses of that particular destination. So that is what that, the next level. If you have a competitive scenario where a role, a set of roles, let's say about 50 FTEs or 100 FTEs playing various roles, can you, you know they're attractive to move out. Uh, the fit is equally good between, let's say, Bangalore um, and uh, Manila. Then you would need to do a health check in both places very quickly and decide which of those, uh, you know, at, at the next level of uh, analysis, which of those two centers uh, scored better, uh, you know, and therefore won the competition, if you like, to absorb that growth. That's great. That was the missing piece in my brain. So thank you. That I guess a better way to have formed that question is what's the next step if you have a tie? And the tiebreaker is a deeper analysis that we like to call a health check. So perfect. That that settles my um, confusion. So I don't see any other questions coming in. We're right at the end of the hour time slot that we had for today. Um, if there's any last minute questions or if as the audience steps away, if other questions arise, um, let me go back to the closing slide where we have some contact information. You can uh, follow up with Hamanth and Pankaj directly if that's something you'd like to do. And as a reminder, of course, the slide deck and the recording will be shared uh, from my email. You're welcome to reach out to me as well, and I can put you in touch with um, some of our advisory team members who can um, dive deeper into these topics with you if that's something you'd like to do. Um, but Pankaj, Heyman, thank you both very, very much for your time today. Um, really helpful deep dive into this process. If you have any final thoughts or well wishes for the audience, I'll give you a moment to uh, share those before we close up shop. Well, thank you, Noranz. Thank you. Thanks, Pankaj. And thank, uh, thanks to everybody who attended. Uh, the questions were very meaningful. Uh, and you've... Uh, been a great audience by way of your participation in the polls and in the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thanks again. And if, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this, these are monthly sessions, monthly webinar series. And so hope to catch you at the next one. And if you're not already on our mailing list and you'd like to be, you can hop on our website and, and sign up there and that'll keep you in touch. Um, kind of a, on a regular basis as to what we're up to and what's our next topic of interest. Um, but once again, thank you everybody for your time and uh, see you next time.